but I had a I had a way of starting. Are you ready? Yes. Are you Are you ready? I I'm yeah I guess so. Okay, uh, let's one, two, three, go. Right? Did you see what I did? You counted to three and you said go. Yeah, because three is the magic number. I thought, I thought you were going to start singing. I thought you were going to no, start singing. No, I just thought it would be a clever way. I thought it would be a clever way to start because we're talking about three. That's all. We are talking about three today, um, which <laughs> might seem like a weird. First of all, okay. So before we do the intro, though, I just want to say Ben Hatke on location. We're we're checking in with reporter Ben Hatke on location. Um, have you located Luca Basla? No, the Luca Basla well is um, actually boarded up so that no no child can get near it. It has a big sheet of uh, of aluminum above it. I mean, there are different fontanas and and wells and things, but the one close to our house that I think of as the Luca Basla well is is closed off entirely, which makes it even more creepier if you ask me it's it it, because then like you can feel those fingers coming out from between yes so breaking news luca basla has fled the country oh or i mean he's just i I don't have to worry about the well anymore i i don't i don't know oh but can i tell you another can i tell you a story speaking of um creatures in this place i was so excited to tell you where I, i was so excited to tell you so i got way late on the way home when we were going to start this podcast and uh, I got the, by our neighbor Paulo and we were kind of putting in a, a new, what do you call those? Because things? for our listeners, you are currently in Italy. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm in a tiny village in Italy called Gravagna Montale. So I'm way up in the mountains. There's probably like 30 people who live here year round. Um, it's, it's as a location to talk about mythological creatures and, and especially like, creepy folkloric tradition this is you can't you can you'd be hard pressed to find a better spot and luca boslo we talked about in our very first episode about yes mermaids yes but today so, see i'm just trying to tie um, it together i'm trying to tie it oh, together you are, and, you're doing, and you're doing so great i'm tying this together because today but right before i came here i was talking to a werewolf what i was talking to a werewolf right before we started the podcast i'm not even joking uh, okay so um so elaborate on that. I'm gonna have to back up a little bit. So, um, so there's a legend. So I'm in Gravania, and it's this craggy, mountainy village. But then, if you wind down the road, you'll get to a a, a proper town called Pontremoli. And Pontremoli is built across two rivers. It's got a lot of bridges, and then at the top of the hill, there is uh, this old medieval castle. And the name. The sort of streets surrounding the castle are the older streets in Pontremoli. So they go back They're They're really medieval, narrow streets. And for a long time, they were. It was the shadier section of the town, right? <clears throat> there was a legend in Pontremoli of the werewolf. And it's just, it's a werewolf legend. It's, you know, uh, like a stranger comes to town. It may be the odd looking person. It may be this person or that person, um, there are different ways to ward off the werewolf by putting like a bottle of water outside your door, stuff like this, but it's always going to carry somebody off. When you go up into these narrow streets and you think about it, what it would be like without a whole lot of outdoor lighting at night, <laughs> it would be terrifying, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, today when I, I, came, I got back up to the, the village, uh, Anna's cousin was there and she was like, oh, come meet my friend. He's the one who does the werewolf show in Pontremoli. And I was like, oh. oh. And he does this, he takes that legend of the werewolf and he does sort of a <clears throat> sort of a walking tour of that area and then through the castle. And he tells the legend of the werewolf and then um, at the end, the werewolf appears. And that's all I know because I haven't seen the show. I'm going to go next week. I was going to say, I feel like you need to document this for the show. I really do. I really do. And I think, and he's doing, I, can't, I, I don't know if it's like the only one of the summer or something like that, but I'm going to try to go. It's supposed to be next Friday and I'm going to try to go. Cause I was like the moment, and I was sitting up there like at her house talking to this guy. I was like, I just, <laughs> like, I would be like, I'm such a huge fan. 
<laughs> because I don't, I mean, I, of werewolves, you know, like I, I would start. So I told him, like, you know, like, oh, I do this mythology podcast with my friend Zach and we did a whole episode of this. And I was talking about medieval werewolves. And so we, we uh, and we only spoke very briefly, but it was it was really fun because I was because the, the can you interview him? I, I'm maybe serious. Well. Can you maybe interview I'll, him yeah, for the I'll show? Talk, I'll, I'll talk to him. I'll see what I can do. I'll, I'll do an interview with him for the show. Because, like, he yeah. is very much a, it is very much a medieval werewolf legend where there's, like, a lot of fluidity between the man and the wolf, right? Yeah. Is it a weird, right. is it a weird guy or is it a wolf? Like, like it's not the full moon and the skin bursting forth and, ow. Yeah. It's something it's something stranger and older and like less pinned down mm. um so anyway just super interesting stuff and uh i will go forth and bring back a full report or perhaps i won't maybe i'll something will happen you know mm. maybe i won't come back <laughs> or you'll come but, back and you'll be yeah. like hairier and scratching your, behind just, your ear i'll just have a vacant look in my eye yeah. Like something happened, but I can't. It's beyond words. Yeah, he was never really. He was never really the same after that. <laughs> he say. wouldn't talk about the interview. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and when they play it, it's just like a bunch of static. <laughs> oh, today we're not talking about werewolves, not really. Um, but today we're talking about three. Part of yeah. this is because. Three in in fairy tales and folklore and mythology and even in human psychology, three is a really important number. And so I I sort of I sort of pitched this to you where I was like, Yeah, let's try an episode about three. Rule of three, three is the magic number. Yeah. I don't know. Do we want to talk about the number three a little bit or sort of its its importance, or do we want to kind of get just like right into it well i do want to say like um i do just i do like just reiterating how important three is because uh in storytelling and i think like you know okay so and i think we'll talk about this a bit during the podcast but it's it is the the smallest number that you can get to create a pattern with two Mm -hmm. is not a pattern but three is and beyond that yeah you can go beyond that but three is your first primary like number for pattern making um so i think that's important and um and there, it recurs so many times in story like third time's the charm uh mm-hmm. you get three three wishes um so so it's kind of part of our three is already part of our storytelling landscape and um and what i think of what I, what having my specific uh dad the the architect engineer dad like I always remember I always remember three is the like a tripod. It's the first number of legs that you can have where you have a and it's stable on every surface, right? A four legged chair. If one of the legs is like 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 if the ground or one of the legs is not completely aligned, you have that wobbly chair feeling. And you have that with any other mm-hmm. set, but not with a tripod. A tripod will find like firm footing on uneven ground. Or with the legs slightly uneven, right? And that's why. I'm... Yeah, and three is is yeah, it's a number of balance, and I'm both. Yeah, so that's it, the number of balance. Yeah, yeah, yep. In good joke telling, which I feel like mm-hmm. part of why I, you know, I love jokes, and part of why mm-hmm. I love jokes is because I feel like they're such a a good joke is such a sophisticated form of storytelling, as far as I'm concerned. Right. Yeah, it's fundamental. Yeah. Um, and one of the uh, one of the tenets of a good joke is it's always it, the rule of three works in jokes too, right? It's yeah. always you know yeah. the first guy walks into the bar, sets something up. The second guy walks into the bar, sets something up. The third guy walks into the bar and destroys the setup. The, so, the twist, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and so in good joke telling, it's almost always the same thing. It's it's that three. Yeah, and they talk about the rule of thirds and. In- in landscapes, um, mm-hmm. where you know it's it's like either two thirds, it's like either two thirds land and one third sky, or two thirds sky and one third land. But you kind of divide your canvas. Like we think in thirds in a lot of ways. It's really cool. Which is which is funny because in some ways, 
in some ways, <laughs> so many of us also think in duality, but then right. you start to realize like sort of how kind of unnatural that can be, you know? Right. And, yeah. and sort of, you know, right. Light and dark day and night. But, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, there's always a third, at least a third option. And so I think it's funny that, that, I don't know, we, we would need like some sort of anthropologist or psychologist or something, I think. Oh, yeah. But oh, just thinking whole, about yeah. how, obviously, we see some things in duality because we are symmetrical creatures, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. But then seeing, but then, uh, like we said, like how, how three and the triple is, is, is the number of balance. And I mean, uh, man, we could just... <laughs> I'm not I'm not educated enough <laughs> to talk more about that um but but it's like you you just but you start seeing it it everywhere mm -hmm. I mean yeah. even in in artwork you were talking about landscapes but in all artwork composition the triangle um yeah. is 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 a foundation of good composition in in 2D art um, Sure yeah I'm sure we could find other examples <laughs> Oh Oh wait, we have to do our we have to do our flipping. I forgot we all have a we have a contest. Not a contest, yes. but uh, it's it's left to chance. It's left to Lady Fortuna to see who is mm -hmm. the, uh, the first to go. Yes, I wish I had a three sided coin, but I don't. So I have the Ewok coin. I have okay. the Ewok coin. You get to choose heads or tails. Heads is the Duloc. Tails is the Ewok. Um, okay. And then uh, you get to pick. Whatever, if it lands on that, you get to choose who goes first. Okay. 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 All right. Um, and I am, wait, here we go. Ready? Three, two, one, flip. Ewok. Okay, it's heads. So I win. Oh, you win. Okay. So that means. So I, I am in your hands. Um, I'm actually going to go first. Sweet. Okay. So I chose a story. And it's a story that uh, I think most of us know called the Billy Goats Gruff or sometimes the three Billy Goats Gruff. Now, Ben, you know this story, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think I do. Are we going to, are you going to, are you going to revolutionize Well, okay. Me? So, so, so this is going to sound like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of punting off the responsibility, but tell me the story of the Billy Goats Gruff. I mean, you can tell me a very concise version, but just, just tell me because okay. it, it's not a long story. No, basic, concise uh, childhood version is that there are three goats living on a hillside. They look across and they see the other hillside has greener grass or they want the grass for some reason. Uh, between the two hillsides is a bridge. Under the bridge lives a troll. The first little billy goat says, I'm going to go. Um, and he goes to the bridge and he confronts the troll. And the troll says, uh, some litany, I'm going to eat you. And he says, well, wait for my second goat. He's much tastier or whatever, you know, bigger, maybe fatter. So he gets across and the troll waits. And so the next one comes, we're, we've got both three main characters in a litany of three repetitions. Uh, troll comes at, out and he says, I'm gonna eat you. And he says, well, no, you went for my third brother. Okay. Uh, he goes across to the other side. And um, then the third one comes along and the troll hops out. And the third Billy Goat is much too much to contend with. He's too big for the troll and he butts him off the bridge and he falls into the water and he goes to the other side. And then I don't know, I guess that's they either live happily ever after or they find out that the grass really isn't greener on the other side. The end. <laughs> that's exactly right. That That is yeah. the story. That is the story that most of us know. Um, now, what I found out about this story is um, this is actually uh, the, the, the written version that most of us know was written uh, or, or compiled by a Norwegian fairy tale collector. So much like the Brothers Grimm. Interesting. Uh, but they were they were Norwegian. Uh, their names were Peter Kristen Abjornsen and Jorgen Moe. And they traveled around Jorgen. and gathered and compiled fairy tales. Now, this story, they committed this story to paper, and it was published uh, in, let's see, what is it, 1841, which seems sort of remarkably late to me, but um, okay. but I, I, I suppose not. I'm sure, again, there are folklorists out there that would tell me, you know, no. Um, in Norwegian, the goats are actually called Bruce, B-R-U-S-E. 
Uh, but the but the in okay. the English translation, they are known as as gruff. Something that's interesting is that uh, in some. I wonder. If, I, can I, I yeah. ask? I wonder. There's a possibility that Bruce is um, related to the word gruff. You know what I? Which sounds a little bit like gruff. So I wonder if etymologically that could be. I was wondering there. that, and I I was doing some some searching. I mean, basically through just like Google Translate. So not very sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Not 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 super reliable. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I wondered if maybe Bruce meant something like brute or brutish or something. Ooh, um, okay. So yeah, yeah any yeah. native Norwegian uh, speakers, uh, let us know. But, um, but right. So, so <clears throat> something that's interesting too, is that uh, sometimes the goats are, are, are depicted as sort of like a baby, a mother and a father, but that's really, that's really oh, okay. uh, rare and unusual and more modern in the traditional telling. They are, mm-hmm. They are, it is heavily implied that they are brothers, that they, I mean, they're Billy goats. Yeah. These three goats know that, that, you know, the, the beautiful meadow is across the bridge and they want to cross to get, you know, the good grass. And then, you know, the troll is in their way. And, uh, just like you said, it goes down, just like you said. Now, one of the things that I loved about this was like so many fairy tales, anybody who, who has dug any deeper than the surface of any of these fairy tales knows that original fairy tales are always darker than the versions we get now. Oh, sure. yeah. So, so, so where that comes in, in this is, is it plays out just that way, except like you said, what happens? Well, the third Billy goat, who's the biggest and the fattest is too much for the troll. And he butts the, the troll and knocks the troll off the bridge and goes on his way. Well, in the original story, in the original translation, this this is how it goes down, and and I'm gonna read this. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm coming to gobble you up, roared the troll. Well, come along. I've got two spears, and I'll poke your eyeballs out at your ears. I've got besides two curling stones, and I'll crush you to bits, body and bones. That was what the big billy goat said. And then he flew at the troll and poked his eyes out with his horns and crushed him to bits, body and bones, and tossed him into the cascade. And after that, he went up the hillside. There, the billy goats got so fat, they were scarcely able to walk home again. <laughs> and if the fat hasn't fallen off them, why, they're still fat. And so, snip, snap, snout, <laughs> this tale's told out. Oh, Yeah, man. so in the original, the billy goat, you know, it's sort of like, comedic right where it's like oh he knocks the troll off the bridge this one no he pulverizes the troll yeah he goes splash (laughs) (laughs) two more things i want to talk about um and then i'll be done with this one is so there are variations of this story there is um and the the variations of the story all have the similar premise although uh in some of them particularly in a german version uh it's not a troll it's a wolf okay this one i found very very odd. And again, maybe it's maybe it's just the 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 Germanness of it. But I'm going to I'm going to read this to you and uh, see if you can kind of figure this out. This is the ending to the German, the German variant. Finally, the ram goat approached. The wolf's heart laughed inside his body when he saw the stately fellow. He was about to spring on him and grab him by the throat when two things caught his attention. The ram's spikes and his bag. Now, remember, Mm. these are boy goats. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Tell me, Ram, what are those big spikes on your head? And what is that bag for between your legs? Oh, replied the Ram. The spikes are a pair of pistols, and the bag is where I carry my powder and lead. Oh, nice. In that moment, as such animals often do, the Ram rubbed his left horn against his flank. The wolf thought that he was loading his pistol, and he took flight. Thus, the first family of goats arrived happily in the land. Their descendants have multiplied so much that Hessen, which is the, I guess, German town where this takes place, now provides the neighboring lands with its surplus every year. That's yeah, interesting. interesting. Where, uh, you know, here the, the goat basically scares off the wolf with his big balls. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> It's 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 less violent if you think about it. Yeah, yeah, but it's also like the threat. It's yeah, it's also post uh, post um, uh, fire weapon. Um, 
Sure, firearms and guns, yeah. basically. Yeah, firearms. Yeah, which dates it dates that telling a little bit. So, um, so the last thing I want to talk about before again before we move on is um, in reading about this, and and I've come across this when looking up other fairy tales. There's something called the Arne Thompson Uther Index, and so like if you go on Wikipedia or oh, you go yeah. anywhere, yeah, you know, you look up a fairy tale and it it'll, it'll often tell you. Uh, this fairy tale has an ATU, that's Arn Thompson Uther index type of, and then it'll give sort of like a random number. So I was like, what the heck is this thing? So I started doing, I started looking into it. And yeah. so literally the Arn Thompson Uther index is just that. It's, it's, it's an attempt to catalog fairy tales and folk tales into specific types. And this will, this will make even more sense in a minute. Yep. Um, but so it was originally compiled in 1910 by a Finnish folklorist named Antti Arne. Uh, and then it was revised and expanded in 1928 by an American folklorist whose name was Stith Thompson. Now, in 2004... I love that name, by the way. Stith. Is it Stith Thompson? S-T- Stith Thompson. S-T-I-T-H. Stith. That's awesome. Stith, like that. Stith, Stith Thompson. Thompson. Folklorist. <laughs> He's got a cool jacket. You know that. He's got a cool coat. Yeah, yeah, he does. He does. He does. Stiff Thompson, folklorist. Uh, <laughs> so then in 2004, it was revised yet again by a German folklorist named Hans Jörg Uther. And he revised uh, this catalog because he noted two things. One, the, the previous fellows... Uh, had done this with a very uh, Western European centric outlook. Sure. Um, and so he expanded it to include more global folk tales and mythology and things like that. But the other thing is that he also noticed that a lot of the tales, uh, many of the original folk tales in, in the catalog would sometimes be listed as just obscene. And so what... <laughs> And so what Uther did was he said, no, this this is important, um, you know, so so acknowledging the importance of fairy tales that actually do have expressly sexual themes and sexual um, mm-hmm. content. And so uh, rather than just sort of placing all of those into the dirty pile. Into a, into a bucket. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. Um, so, for example, the Billy Goat's Gruff is classified as a type 122F. And that is the okay. eat me when I'm fatter story. And so that just clicked for me. Like oh, once, once I got nice. that, the eat me when I'm fatter story, it's like, oh my God. And you just, you start thinking of all these stories where that's you the, see the premise. Yeah. Yeah. There are Br'er Rabbit stories like that's that. Ha- there are. That's Hansel and Gretel too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hansel and Gretel hasn't, has exactly. Like I'm interested in in delving into that catalog, but but in some of my research, I think it is sure. very dense and dry, and it's it appears to be a very academic piece of work, uh, which is fine. Oh yeah, well, yeah. It's, but yeah, it's it's categorizing storytelling, which is always yeah you know, right, <laughs> sucking some of the life out of it, but also adding a little bit of interest historically. That's, that's cool. yeah, and like again, for me, it was just like sort of being able to distill that story down to one little phrase. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I just I thought was was eye opening really for me. So that's it. That's the three Billy Goats Gruff. I love it. I feel like I know them better now. I mean, I want to do a I want to do a version of this story. Oh, wouldn't that be fun? Because uh, like because it really sort of just like I really imagined this like shaggy goat you know like this oh yeah that last goat he's he's a monster yeah yeah he's he is a tough guy um kind of like yeah, monster i mean kinda, I'm, i guess i'm imagining gruffy yeah yeah gruffy would be good yeah gruffy he's like he he's got those shoulders and that oh, great yeah gruffy would be good oh he'd be a great he'd be a great biggest billy a goat great goat. model oh <laughs> yeah gruffy of course being uh one of the goats in your life. My goat that lives at home. Yeah, one one of the goats. Yeah, he's the only goat in my life right now. <laughs> he's, the only, he's the only goat I want in my life right now. He's a good one. Well, well, there is going to be there is going to be a lot of carryover um, with this next section mm-hmm. because I have also picked a a fairy tale. I have picked one called One Eye, Two Eye, Three Eye. Mm. 
or little one eye, little two eye, little three eye. And it was really interesting. I was actually going to talk about the Arn Thompson uh, category. Little one eye, two eye, three eye is an Arn Thompson 511, 511, or however it is. Okay. So I started learning about that as well. But you did a much better uh, overview of that than than I had planned to. So that's fantastic. So what is a um, what is a five one one? Those are they're very close to the um, the Cinderella stories. It's the, um, the the like the persecuted young youngest daughter who is happy in the mm-hmm. end, sort of. Okay. Um, Cinderella is, is very similar with her stepsister and the mother like oh, constantly beating on her, you know, and then something magical happens and they all get their comeuppance and maybe she maybe she shows them some mercy in the end. Right. Okay. So it's 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 one categorization uh, categorization apart from from a Cinderella story. Okay. And there's other ones that are similar, like magical pear tree and stuff like this. Uh, so what happened? I like to tell where what got me onto whichever. St- you know, creature or story I'm doing. And um, this this is a friend of mine stayed in this house that we're in some years ago when she was doing, um, I guess she was doing a master's thesis in like fairy tale and folktale stuff, literature. Mm -hmm. And she stayed here like uh, over, I think some of the winter months while she was studying and she left some big heavy, uh, books of fairy tale collections um at the house and one of the ones that she had left that i pick up every time i'm here and it has been worn so much that the spine is broken and now it's in two pieces is <laughs> the complete Grimm's fairy tales mm. so i have this copy of the complete Grimm's fairy tales from my friend gwen and it's got a lot of little notes in the margins she was very concerned in her research of this, deciding which of these are true fairy tales and which of them are folk tales. So a lot of her, her side notes are that. Um, but what's also interesting about I mean, this, I know there's a difference, but I don't know if I could explain. Uh, she had some ideas. I'm not. Yeah. Like it's, it has something to do with um, material things having magic. In hmm. them, I think was something was some uh, version of research that she was going okay. through. Right. Um so if so, if there's anyway, uh, sort of like this like incarnational magic in, in material world kind of thing. So magic pear tree would definitely be definitely be it. Um, but in the back of it, like I hadn't realized the first time I read it, in the back there's this whole like Joseph Campbell analysis of the fairy tales and the oral tradition of it and all this. And it it rereading that it it some of it clicked into place why some of these things are so strike us as so odd um sounding when like nonsensical things happen i love the ending of um the billy goes gruff that you said what was it snip snap snout this yep. tales told out um there was this so like so these are these are oral tradition stories right it was the grims who went around in like 1813 or whatever collecting mm-hmm. these the tradition of it predates in- interior light Right. So in this analysis I was reading, it's like very much about like the focus of your day changing, like the the middle part of the day is this very like forward moving, repetitive, um, you know, you're making a thing, you're making a thing, you're 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 collecting the grain, you're collecting the grain, you're weaving the thing, you're, you know, and then in the evening, there's just like firelight and the sort of the rhythm of the day changes and you, you, you tell these stories. And they found um, a lot of the stories in the Grimm's Tales come to us from one particular woman that they mention a lot, Dorothea Vyman. They found her in, she was one of the ones who gave them a lot of tales uh, when they were like specifically in 1813 and 1814. And they were very impressed with her. She, she was very old when they found her, when they mm-hmm. met her and became friends with her and she started telling the stories. But what would imp- what impressed them was like repetitious lyricalism of the stories and the fact that she would tell them exactly the same every time. She wasn't she wasn't telling us she wasn't remembering the events. She was telling the story, and if she made an error, she would back up, start again, and re- mm. you know tell it the right way. 
you know. And so more like more like singing a song than telling a story. Right. And that it sort of. Yeah. Like like a recitation. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why some of this like kind of dream logic comes into fairy tales where, well, in this story, there are three daughters born and one. The first daughter has one eye. And the second daughter has two eyes and the third daughter has three mm -hmm. eyes. And like everybody else in the world is apparently a two eyed person, but they persecute two uh, little two eyes. <laughs> from the way she looks, which seems very strange, but it's, it kind of goes with this like, like fairy tale logic. And um, so yeah, I will just I will just give you an overview of little one eye, little two eye, little three eye. And what I like about this, yeah, is, please, I don't know this story. Okay, so what I like about this is that we have both the three eyes, and we have this repetition of three in the story. So we have like a physical three eyes, and we have like this repetition of three. And so these three daughters are born. Um, you know, they're this poor family and they have what little one eye, little two eye and little three eye. And, um, they little two eyes is super persecuted by her sisters for being so normal and they, they don't like her. So they send her out. And this story also has a goat in it. They send her out to go watch the goat and they don't get, she never gets enough to eat. So she's always hungry. She goes up into the field to watch the goat. And the wise, this wise woman appears to her, a fairy um, godmother or wise woman. She's that kind of stock character. She appears and she teaches little two eye uh, to say this rhyme, like little goat bleat, little table appear. That's it. <laughs> and then this table full of food appears. <laughs> she eats like she likes. And then she can say little goat bleat, little table away. And the table goes away. And she goes home and she's she's well fed. And then her sisters are like, oh, when they when they have dinner that night, she's like, well, yeah, I'm just I'm really not hungry. It's fine. And they're like, what is going on? You're not hungry. We, we, we don't even give you anything to eat. So the mother, who also hates little two eyes, she sends little one eye to go and find out what's going on. So little one eye accompanies little two eye the next time she goes out. Now we're on time number two. And little one eye goes up into the hills and Little Two Eye thinks, oh, Mother has sent her to, to, to spy on me. So she sings a song and Little One Eye finally falls asleep. And Little Two Eye says, Little Goat Bleat, Little Table Appear. Same thing happens. She eats, Little Goat Bleat, Little Table Disappear. She, she, it's gone. Little One Eye wakes up, doesn't know what has happened. Take, she goes home and she says, oh, you know, I'm, the sun got to me. I didn't find out what happened. And the mother's like, oh, well, I'll send Little Three Eyes next. Little, so now we're on the third repetition. Or little two eyes sings a song, and little three eyes falls asleep. And oh, creepiest part of the story is, of course, that third eye of little three eyes stays awake, which, mm. which I just love. Don't like it. I love it. So gross. <laughs> and so little three eyes with her third eye sees uh, little two eyes say, "Little goat bleat, little table appear, eat up all the food," and she she quickly closes her eyes and they go back down and little three eyes tells the mother what happened and then the mother oh we to, this is a grim fairy tale the mother slaughters the goat the mother's like i am going to cut this goat's neck and uh little two eyes is like no my goat she slaughters the goat right outside the front doorway very very sad but then wait how did she get the goat did she summon the goat oh like, no no it's their goat to... it's their goat Oh. And she was always sent up with the goat into the hills to watch it. And the wise the wise woman oh, okay. said, well, you know, I'll teach you what to do. And you say this to the goat. I see. Yeah. And then um, I think the wise woman comes and says, don't, don't worry, it's going to be fine. And then the blood soaks in. And the next morning, this pear tree grows up, a magical pear tree full of beautiful pears that you can eat. Anyway... It, you have another repetition of three. Little one, I go up, try to get the pears. She can't get the pears down because the branches move away from her. Little t uh, little three eye, you go up, get the pears. You know, she can't get the pears because they move away from her. Only little two eyes can get the pears down. And you'd think they'd be nice to her, but no, they're still terrible to her. And then a knight comes along and he's like, those pears look delicious. Oh, and then when the knight comes, they're like, hide little two eyes, hide little two eyes. And they hide her in this barrel and the knight's like, I would like some of those pears. And nobody in the house can get the pears except little little two eyes. And finally, um, they let little two eyes out. She gets some pears down for the knight. And he's like, this is great. 
you can come live with me since these other people are terrible. And he takes them her away, and eventually they fall in love and they get married. And when little Two Eyes uh, reaches the castle, she looks out the, her window one day, and the pear tree has moved and is now growing right outside her window. And they live very happily until they are old. And then these beggars come to the door, and they are in rags. And it's little one eye and little three eye. Uh, and she welcomes, she welcomes, she welcomes, I don't know, I think she welcomes into their house and, they, and forgives them. And they repent of ever having been mean to their sister. You can imagine telling that story around the fire and then tying it up with that, that like, they were really sorry for having been mean to their sibling. <laughs> Please, everyone, uh-huh. give us some peace. You know? <laughs> yes. But, uh, yeah. Yep. So that is Little One Eyes, Little Two Eyes, and Three Eyes. I like it because it has the, 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 the creepiness factor. And I like these, uh, these Grimm's Tales, especially, especially up here, because Gravani can be really, I mean, it's high summer now, but once you get to uh, early spring and, and late autumn, it gets very, it gets very grim up here too. It gets um, cold and gray, and you can imagine these. You can imagine both telling these stories, and you can imagine like seeing these stories. Yeah, I love trying to imagine like the those sisters, the you know, and like I I could definitely see. Yeah, this would have been a good one for like Jim Henson storyteller. I can, oh my god! I can gosh. imagine yeah, the yeah, prosthetics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would have been awesome. We hit our fairy tales. Uh, so this one is 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 very left turn from there. Okay. <laughs> uh, have you ever heard of a triffid? No, you mentioned that you were doing a triffid, and I didn't even look it up. I didn't know anything about it. So I think a lot of people, or I don't know about a lot of people, but I think people who have heard of triffids <clears throat> may have heard them from uh, the movie... Day of the Triffids, uh, which is a pretty schlocky, I believe, 1962 movie. Um, But it is actually based on a 1951 novel by John Wyndham. Okay. So a Triffid is a very large, mobile, carnivorous plant. In in the novel, uh, Day of the Triffids, I don't... I don't want to go through the whole plot of the novel, okay. but um, it's basically <laughs> it's basically a po- post-apocalyptic story. So uh, one night there are it, the book opens with um, the main character uh, whose name is Bill Mason, and he is a very typical 1950s science fiction hero in that he is the, uh, you know, he he's a scientist. Mm-hmm. He's 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 you know he's very intelligent, but he's also a man's man. Mm-hmm. You know he's he's very capable. Mm-hmm. He's very capable in 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 every sort of um, you know you, you like you imagine him as you know he's the lantern jawed. You know he would have a pipe. Yes, and yeah. Knows all about physics and all this kind of stuff, but also you know has his his football days and you know can you know, best most men in a fight, that that sure, kind of thing. Sure, sure, sure. He has been working with triffids, so triffids have existed, but but in the book, they're never really explained where they came from. Okay. Um, but one night, there is a green meteor, all, there's all these green meteors showering in the sky, and everyone who has looked at this meteor shower, which is most people, are now blind. Okay. And Bill Mason is not blind because during the shower, he was, uh, he had been attacked by a triffid and his eyes had been bandaged. So the story is really about, uh, and, and it is, it is written really well um, about him basically traversing through London and this, like I said, this post-apocalyptic, like nothing is operating and there's only a few people who have sight. Everyone else is blind. And one of the things that happens is sometimes a blind person will overpower somehow uh, a sighted person and kind of have them as their seeing eye dog and everything's just going, going to hell. And so in addition to this sort of post-apocalyptic 
hellscape, there's also, there's not zombies, there's triffids. So what does this have to do with three? Okay, well, the reason that a triffid is called a triffid is because it is got three legs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's described as being between seven and ten feet tall, uh, and it has three main parts. So it has a base, a trunk, and a head. The head is like a flower pitcher plant okay. kind of thing, and it has this venomous stinger that it whips at people, particularly at their eyes. And then it has the trunk, which is just sort of this, you know, like the stalk. Boulder stick. And then the base are, yes. <laughs> and then the, the, the base are these three fleshy root-like appendages that it uses to walk around. This sounds so Dungeons and Dragons. And I mean, and they're kind of silly, which, yeah. which I also like as well. Sure. So he, he describes them moving like this. He says... When it walked, it moved rather like a man on crutches. Two of the blunt legs slid forward, and then the whole thing lurched as the rear one drew almost level with them. Then the two in the front slid forward again. At each step, the long stem whipped violently back and forth. It gave one a kind of seasick feeling to watch it. As a method of progress, it looked both strenuous and clumsy, faintly reminiscent of young elephants at play. One felt that if it were to go on lurching for long in that fashion, it would be bound to strip all of its leaves if it did not actually break its stem. Nevertheless, ungainly though it looked, it was contriving to cover the ground at something like an average walking pace. Hmm. So the book itself, I have read the book. Um, the book itself, I would say the book is pretty good. Um, it's what's kind of interesting, and like I said, without spoiling or sort of getting through the plot, it is very much a post-apocalyptic story. And again, from 1951. So I think it's interesting, you know, post-apocalyptic stories like, you know, The Walking Dead and all that kind of stuff yeah. were not as ubiquitous in 1951. Sure, sure. Um, so, I mean, I think it's interesting to read in, in that sense. I think what is sort of extra interesting is it's called Day of the Triffids. Um, but the triffids don't play into the plot as much as you think they would <laughs> huh, huh, okay sort of without without spoiling any of that but just as far as just a, a kind of schlocky creature i i think triffids are are great and the the movie is actually on youtube if you feel like watching Ooh. i have not watched the whole movie okay. um, but uh it seems like something i would probably want to watch it really does so that's a triffid that is something I knew nothing about. Walking tripod plant. And it's, it's actually, it's, it's fun to imagine that as, I don't know, just an additional horror in, in, in a kind of like um, falling world like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. by the way, there are triffids. In the book, they actually do explain that these plants, like they were kind of giving them different names mm -hmm. and, and coming from the like tri and the tripod. But then... But it is. But then they, you know, talk about in the book that. But they're not trifids; they are trifids, and it's okay. It's, it's kind of funny to me that that they take time to explain that. Yeah. And uh, you know, I I think he probably had a cool name on his hand, like Triffid, and he yeah. wanted to use it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, it's it's not trifid; it's Triffid. Like Bill Mason takes the pipe out of his mouth and he's like, you know, it's Triffid, not trifid. Only a cretin would say trifid. <laughs> this is actually such perfect timing i didn't know it was going to turn out this way um because this is going to lead us right into my next creature because i have been um, i have been jumping into the greek uh i've been <laughs> uh, i am reading i am currently reading circe by madeline miller and this is a re it's almost it's it's a retelling of of you know um, you know Circe on her island and Odysseus comes and and the, basically the life life of the the Greek witch Circe right mm -hmm. but it's very much in that it's it's really good I'm really I I'm definitely really really enjoying it it's also part of that sort of um, you know that that trend of um, there's Cruella and they did the um, 
The Queen from Snow White. Maleficent. Maleficent. That's the one. It feels like, oh no, another one of these, right? A humanizing the the female villain from a, a bygone tale. And mm-hmm. and sometimes that's really great, but it was clearly a trend, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was I feel like Wicked was the like the first right and um so this could very easily have been something where you read it and it's just like oh there's another there's another entry in this trend but it's actually it's really really good it's a real page it's a real page turner it um takes all of the the greek myths you know and and tells them from from this just from a different perspective and 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 a humanizing perspective and um and you like everyone, and I have a favorite character uh, in this Daedalus, father of Icarus, who, mm. who comes into the tale, mm-hmm. and the way they, uh, the way she portrays him, I just, I just really love, and I don't, I don't really want to say too much more about it than that, except it's a, it's a relatively fast read, it's heaps of fun, and it is a. Who's and, the author again? Uh, Madeline Miller, she, and she, this, this, this seems okay. to be her thing. Her other book was. Song of Achilles. That Song of Achilles was her other book, uh, her first book. So I don't know. It, it's just it's just really funny. If you have any love for the the Greek myths, um, this is uh, this is great, and it and it segues perfectly into my second three themed character, Cerberus, the multi headed. Mm, I'm familiar. Yes, and we all are. And I'm just going to take us quickly through Cerberus, the Cerberus we know, and maybe one that we don't. Um, actually, you you quizzed me. Describe Cerberus to me. Cerberus, the dog. Cerberus. Uh, he's a three headed dog. Uh, he guards the gates to Hades. Um, I think sometimes he's described as having a snake's tail, but I think mostly it's it's about having being a dog with three heads. Yeah. Um, I also think like my perception is that Cerberus is not necessarily like an evil creature. He's, he's a dog. He's got a job. He, he guards the gates. Um, and then one of Hercules's labors was to actually get him right. Like yeah. to drag him up. And then I guess he does that and then just brings him back. So that's what I know about Cerberus. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's that's your spot on. Twelfth labor labor of Hercules is is getting Cerberus. He, I think, in some ways, he's he's not supposed to use any weapons, so he wraps his lion skin around around his heads. Um, he's really uh, described early on, like like he's described as either multi headed or three headed, right? And mm-hmm. the, like I've mm-hmm. noticed with a lot of the Greek things, they just love to like. It feel, okay, it's kind of going back to this whole oral tradition thing, and I have this whole, I and I'm just, I'm just spitballing and throwing theories out of the wall uh, thing, but like I have this idea that like this the the oral tradition thing, you can say things, you know, you're repeating stories, you're saying things, and you can make these things when you're saying words, they can be as crazy as you want them to be, mm-hmm. but then those stories land to the artists, right? And the artists are like, 50 head. What, what am I supposed to do with this, <laughs> right? Okay, three, three heads. How about three? How about, how about three? <laughs> three is enough. It's weird, right? And so like, I'll give you three. So like, it's, <laughs> when he shows up on vases, like in the like 500 BC, it's, he's, he's a three-headed dog. But he's also described, you're right, as having a, a, a snake tail. But also he's described as having snakes coming out of his body. Hmm. Also. Interesting. Also wonderful to say in a story right really weird mm-hmm. to depict are like snake heads just sprouting out of his like we don't know so again on the the greek urns that i looked up is very artfully handled <laughs> snakes coming out of his body it's three big heads <laughs> kind of a wiggly tail mm-hmm. um so i just i just have this idea and also son of he, uh, like monsters beget monsters right so he's not the he's not the pup of a, of a another dog he's the son of Typhon, who's like a dragon, and Echidna, who, who was a half woman, half serpent. Yeah, they were also the parents in when we did the dog episode. Uh, they right. are also the parents of the Tumesian fox. Oh, and that makes sense because yeah, because Cerberus is also Cerberus is also the, the, the sort of the forerunner of all the um, hellhounds, 
all, and I don't mean all mm. the other hellhounds in, in mythology. I mean like the hellhound story that weaves its way through different mythologies, right? And right down to mm-hmm. the black dog that we we had talked about, and and you know Garm, right. Fen, Garm and Fenris of the Norse mythology were like kept by hell. Right. Um, so all this is like Cer- Cerberus is, seems to be like the. Um, uh, the, the first of that breed of, of dog, right? The proto the prototype. The prototype. Yeah. Um, but I really liked this idea of um, artists getting kind of stymied on some of these oral tradition descriptive descriptions when it comes down to them. Because there's also the chimera, which is like a lion, a goat, and a snake kind of smashed together. But it's so weird right. because it's like described as a lion with like a goat head like coming out of its back. And the third head is a snake tail but it also has the head the t- it's like a tail but at the end of the tail is the snake's head and it's I just yeah i don't know i just really tickled by people making these vases and being like i don't know <laughs> it's funny though that that perspective of you know i mean we're both illustrators mm-hmm. and of of somebody telling you uh what they want you to draw and then you kind of having to be like okay that's not feasible <laughs> yes it's what it feels like you're right it feels like the client and the illustrator <laughs> like oh could it be like this and you're like every hair is a snake yeah, yeah. that you can't draw that that's not no <laughs> <laughs> every hair is a snake. yeah it's exactly that it's like it's like there's but it goes on for a hundred years before it gets to it before somebody's asked to put this on a temple wall right <laughs> And it's right, grown in right, the telling right. every time. And oh, I just love the whole the whole idea of it where the art, the artist is like Gah! daring there. <laughs> um and finally You're not you're not paying me enough. <laughs> you're not paying me it's enough. Like, it's like it's okay, we can do that, but that is you re- realize that's another yeah. round of revisions and that is gonna cost extra. <laughs> <laughs> it's hourly. It's hourly. Yeah, we need this Cerberus by tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, well, I can't do the 50 heads by tomorrow, but I can do three. All right, well, it's going to have to be three then. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh. Man. Instead of the temple, can we just do a, can we just do a single urn? I don't want to do the temple anymore. Just, just one pot. Well, what would one pot? <laughs> what would one yeah. pot? <laughs> 50 heads still, but one pot. You just, you're not getting it. <laughs> Oh my yeah. gosh. So the last thing I want to say about Cerberus is um, I was looking this stuff up and I found, uh, I don't know if I can pronounce this, but we had been talking about the Dictionary of the Infernal, right? Mm-hmm. And what I, mean, I yeah. think I was sending you some of the illustrations from it. Just super interesting stuff. Oh, who put the, I can't remember who put the other Dictionary of the Infernal, but it was, this was like, it actually was the same, around the same times that the Grimm stuff was coming up was that this guy decided to catalog demons and put them into the Dictionary mm-hmm. of the Infernal. And then um, a French landscape artist ended up doing a lot of the pen and ink illustrations for them. And that's what I really like. They're just wacky and weird and fun. But there is Nabarius described as both a raven and a three-headed dog and is one of these... Um, is is kind of like the hellhound in that in that book, three headed dog, and, and probably related back to Cerberus. Yeah, it's just goofy and fun. Like again, the oral tradition. I love what you say. It's like he's a raven, but he's also a dog yeah. <laughs> with three heads. With no, three 50, heads. Yeah. no fifty. No fifty. Fifty. But he's also a yeah. raven. <laughs> You're up. All right. This was an interesting one for me because uh, this was totally new. And this is also something that there is a, a story involved here uh, as far as three goes. And I'm going to really try my damnedest to to do a, a Cliff Notes version because uh, this is really okay. like from an epic poem. So uh, hmm. I know um, next to nothing about Persian mythology. Persia being, you know, uh, uh, current day Iran. Uh, And I started as I was doing research for this episode, I started, you know, going down this path and I and I and I came across this thing and I was just totally enthralled by this story. Uh, It's it's one of the most like actually metal myths that like I've I've I think I've ever come across and also has some of this uh, sort of like Wait, I, I don't know if I understand this. And again, I think it's because probably oral tradition. 
So there is, in Persian mythology, there is an evil entity known as Azi Dahaka. But he's also known as Zahak. Azi Dahaka. Now, and that was something I was trying to figure out is sort of like, where, where does one become the other? And it was, it was vague. So I'm, I'm, I'm claiming a lot of ignorance on this. But Azi Dahaka is basically a three-headed dragon. Uh, any Godzilla fans out there, if you picture King Ghidorah, uh, that's basically Azi Dahaka. Uh, and then there's this story about Ozzy Dahaka. At some point, this epic poem is written called the Shanama. Shanama? Shanama? I'm not sure. You know, we have lots of examples of ancient epic poems. And in this case, Ozzy Dahaka seems to be the same, but now he's called Zahak. And rather than being a three-headed dragon, he is human, uh, but there's, there's, there's more to it. So I want to tell you the story of Zahak. I think you will also see how sort of like, I don't know why there's not more adaptations of this story or, or a movie <laughs> or, or whatever. Okay, so Zahak, not not Zach. It's it's funny. I, I used to have... Oh, I see why you like it. Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, Zahak. Excuse me, Zahak. Uh, I want you to call me that from now on. No. Okay, so Zahak, I've already, I've, all right, I'm going on too long. So Zahak is the son of this good king named Mardis. And Zahak is described as being, he's very handsome and he's clever, but he's also very uh, suggestible. He, he doesn't have maybe a lot of uh, really strong character behind him. So one day Zahak is out and he meets this like really friendly, charismatic guy who who sweet talks him and he's like hey this is this is a really cool guy and the guy tells zahak he's like hey you know if you were to kill your father you would assume the throne and you would be king of the land and zahak's like wow you're right he's like but i i i don't know how to do that i i can't i can't kill my own father and the the charismatic guy says leave everything to me now the charismatic guy is not just any guy he is a Persian god named Araman, who in Islam is also called Iblis, which if I tell you Araman's backstory, you'll know immediately who else he is. So Araman was okay. a spirit of light who was kicked out of heaven for being a jerk. Ah, uh, here we are. So, right. What Araman does is he goes out and he he digs a pit and he covers it with grass and leaves and he waits for Mardis to walk by uh, to go to his praying spot and Mardis falls in the pit and Araman buries him and Mardis dies and he's like, boom, Zahak, there you go, you're king. And Zahak's like, wow, that's great, I'm the king. So he is the king and he's ruling the land and one day a chef comes to the palace and says, oh, mighty, wonderful King Zahak, please, I want to I want to uh, I want to make food for you. It, it would be my honor to make food for you. And Zahak says, OK, sure. So the cook makes food and he makes these beautiful, wonderful, nutritious feasts. And Zahak loves it. Now, an, an, what I think is an interesting element here is uh, this cook also starts preparing meat which Zahak loves. And this was previously a vegetarian kingdom. So now they're mm. eating meat. And Zahak's like, oh, this is great. And he says, oh, chef, you know, these feasts you've been making me have been absolutely wonderful. What, what do you want? How can, as the king, how can I repay you? And the chef says, you know what? I don't want much. All I want is it would please me if I could come over there and just kiss you on your shoulders okay and most of us would probably be a little weirded out by that but not zahak zahak's like sure come on up kiss my shoulders so the cook comes up and he kisses each of zahak's shoulders and suddenly two serpents spring out of his shoulders now it's also notable that the word, apparently the, the ancient word for serpent is also the same as the word for dragon, depending on the context. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of, mm -hmm. and you can see where this kind of connects to the three-headed dragon 
of the earlier. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously the chef is also our man and he sort of is like, (laughs) and he disappears. So Zahak has these two serpents growing out of his shoulders and he calls all of his magicians and all of his physicians and everything. And every time they try to cut the serpents off, they grow back. There's, there's nothing that can be done. Finally, this mysterious physician comes in and he says, I know how to take care of those snakes. Every day you need to feed those snakes uh, to keep them soothed and to keep them from killing you. Um, but the only thing that those snakes eat is the brains of a young man. And so the hawk's like, all right, well, if that's what I got to do, that's what I got to do. And so the physician leaves. And sure enough, the physician is the third form of Araman. Araman. So Araman's whole thing is just like, he's not necessarily trying to like take over the world. He's just sowing chaos, right? So he's just like, <laughs> he's a trickster. Yeah. He has become the trickster. He's become the grist in the mill. He's become the one who finds the boundaries. And ah, oh, so great. Keep going. So Zahak decrees that every night two young men will be brought to the palace and their brains will be fed to the snakes. This goes on. And at one point, so then there's so <laughs> this there's is a, definitely metal. This is pretty good. Yeah. So it's like so these two young men have to be brought to the palace every night and their brains get served to the snakes growing out of Zahak's shoulders. At one point in the poem, there's also a, 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 another story about another king in another kingdom that is killed and Zahak takes over that kingdom. And the reason that that's important to the story is because he ends up taking the king's daughters, who again, as sort of a B-plot, are in, in the castle and um, they start they're the ones who have to prepare the brains and they will take one of the young men who has been brought to the palace and hide him away and substitute it with a sheep's brain. And supposedly, so this is what's really cool about this story is it's like myth and fantasy, but also like tied to history because apparently it also says that all of the men who are spared in this and hidden in the mountains become the Kurdish people. So I thought that was interesting. Okay. That's me. This so so the kingdom has, is being ruled by by Zahak, and one night he has this dream. He has this dream that these three warriors penetrate his castle and kill him. And so he wakes up and he calls in all of his seers and his magicians. And he's like, "I need you to interpret this this dream for me." He's like super paranoid. So one of them, one of the seers, says, "Well, uh, the the what your dream is telling you is it's a vision that this young man is going to come and and kill you, and the man's name is Faradun." And so Zahak is excited. He's like, "I know the name of the guy that's going to kill me." So he sends his agents out, and he's like, "Go find Faradun and kill him before he can get to me." So they go out and they find Faradun, but Faradun's a little baby. And his mother hides him in the woods and he's raised by a magic cow. So <laughs> awesome. So they so so he managed. So this Faradun manages to evade Zahak's agents. Zahak is becoming extremely, extremely paranoid and he ends up ruling for his his rule has lasted like, I think, hundreds and hundreds of years. And so but mm-hmm. he's he's increasingly paranoid about, you know, losing his power as most, you know, dictators and despots are. So one mm-hmm. day, I, I really liked this part because it, it felt uh, it felt modern. So one day he he's really nervous about this and he's like, I know that guy's going to come to the city and he's going to try to kill me. So he writes up this document about how he is a wonderful leader. Uh, the kingdom is stronger than it's ever been. Uh, he he made the kingdom great again, <laughs> and he he summons all of the city's elders and elites, and he says, "I need you to sign this document, endorsing that I am a wonderful, good, just leader, and you would never want anyone else to to lead this city." All of the elites and the elders they're they're too afraid to say anything, so they all sign it except for one, uh, an older guy named Kava. And Kava says, you know what, Zahak? I've had 17 sons, and 16 of them have been killed by you, and the other one is in prison. I'm not signing this. You can go sit and spin. 
and he tears up the document and he storms out. And when he storms out, oh, Kava is a blacksmith. And so he storms out. And when he storms out, he takes off his blacksmith's apron and he ties it to a pole and he starts rallying the citizens to build an army against Zahak. Now, again, talking about history, apparently what's interesting is that over time in the future, this blacksmith's apron future kings add jewels to it and it's used as mm. like the flag like even like to this day oh that's awesome a young man named faradun is is up in the mountains and kava's like hey faradun you need to come down or whatever um I, i'm a little unclear as to how that ends up uh, uh happening but uh so faradun's like well i need a weapon and kava's like hey guess what i'm a blacksmith so he builds Faradun a mace with the head of an ox and it's the or, or, or a cow and this is in memory of the cow that raised Faradun when he was little who at some point in the in the poem Zahak's men did slaughter um oh and sorry I'm going back so in the dream he had the dream that that the man who killed him had this mace with a cow's head on it and so so Kava uses his blacksmithing and 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 creates this mace. So Faradun uh, ends up, it, it, it pretty much plays out. Faradun goes into the castle and he meets the the two women that I had mentioned before, who were who were saving the men. Zahak comes in and he pulls out his dagger and rather than killing Faradun, he kills the woman that Faradun is talking to. Um, and so Faradun turns around and cracks him in the head with the mace. And just as he's about to kill him, this angel appears and says, no, Faradun, don't kill him. He has a different fate. And so they take Zahak and they put him under a mountain and they bind him in lion skin and chains and nails through his skin. And the idea is that Zahak is trapped in darkness under this mountain waiting until the day when he can be summoned again. Oh. And Faradun becomes the first king of the quote unquote modern line of, of kings in Persia. Oh my gosh. I love being, I love him. Wait. I love ending the tale with him waiting under the mountains for the end of days. Yep. Yeah. That's so that's fantastic. what I'm saying is like and and like the depictions of him with these snakes and like these three heads. And so, like I said, this is where I would need like uh, an expert in Persian culture and mythology to sort of tell sure, me. Sure, sure. But like the idea that like it is the same story with the dragon. But then when this was later written down in this poem, he becomes a human. But the two snakes are references so he still has Back three heads because yeah. he's described as having right. three heads, six eyes, three mouths. Right. Yeah. And like, I feel like it's such a good, like, even in in just the quick versions and stuff that I was reading, like seeing the the corruption of Zahak, right, in kind of this yeah. Darth Vadery yeah. kind of way, and and um, how he, like all rulers like that, how he just becomes increasingly more paranoid which causes him to do increasingly more evil to his, yeah. to his people until they, they revolt. Can you remind me of the dates of this, this, the, the poems? Um, no, hold on. Do you have the rough centuries? Okay. Cause there's so much, there's so much, uh, uh parallel stuff going on to other mythologies and to, right. To Judaism and Christianity and stuff with like, the baby being the king's downfall, right, right? Right. And then the king sends sends his people out to kill all the babies. I mean, that's that's Moses, but it's also Jesus, and it's also um, it's also uh, Laura Dannon, you know. <laughs> so like, and 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 the you know hiding hiding away and being raised by somebody else. Yeah. And and you know also the king that's going to come again. It's all it, like it's all there. Right. Um, okay, it's just so, a, so a the form. internet the internet is telling me that this was written between 977 and 1010. Okay, um, that's interesting. Yeah, well, and that's the other thing too is not to get too into the sort of like religious aspects, but even just like the idea of 
of Aroman, like kind of like their devil. Aroman I realize is all fantastic. of the yeah. Abrahamic religions, it's like, what what are you guys fighting for? You're all the same thing. <laughs> I'm gonna piss some people off. But so yeah, this this poem is is basically like one of the main uh tenants or one of the main literary works of Zoroastrianism which is sort of like, as I understand it, it's, it's sort of, it's adjacent to Islam. Yeah. Anyway, that's cool. so yeah, so that was my story of, of Zahak. And again, just thinking about sort of, you know, hero's journey, epic tales. Wow. Yeah. It got me really excited and snakes that have to eat brains, right? Like it's like, yeah, yeah. Like, like this, I'm imagining very much like the temple and him sitting there in that chair, you yeah. know, like, like getting more and more corrupt with every, Every time he has to do this. And and I found it interesting, too, because like in so many fairy tales and old stories, you always you don't hear. I feel like you don't hear a lot about brains, right? You hear it's always like the heart. Yeah. Which which may be more of a Western kind of thing. But here, I guess that's what made it feel so metal to me is it's like, no, it's the brains. He needs the brains. Yeah. Yeah. That got me very excited because the flow of this has been has been very good through the fairy tales and in, through the mythologies, and and it's um, and with my third one, I think it's gonna. I think these are all fitting together nicely. I think it's giving a nice shape to our to our conversation. Yeah, I'm excited because I have no idea what you're about to unleash. Yes, the third one. We talked a little bit ahead of time about what we were doing, but I didn't. You know, we we don't do too much pre gaming, but I definitely said I am not telling you my third one. And oh, I did have this thing where I was thinking, like, I'm going to make him think it's Manny Faces. <laughs> um, because I did think early on, I looked up Manny Faces and I thought like, there, there wasn't enough there, <laughs> frankly. Oh, I think I think one of our close friends would have a lot to disagree with you about but oh no you're right you're right you're right he might well i i do i gotta say like i was fascinated like of all the he-man toys manny faces uh sorry manny faces is one of the uh good he-man characters what are they called the the friend and ally heroic fighters friend and ally heroic fighters a friend and ally he was a friend and ally and and manny faces has a big sort of bucket head so he looks like a he-man character he's got a big sort of bucket head with a knob on top and his power is that he can, he can turn the knob and he can have a man face or a robot face or a monster face. He's uh, many faces because he has great. many faces. Yes. And so I was just like, I think it was one of the most interesting, for a while it was one of the most interesting of the He-Man toys that I had. So anyway, it's not many faces. I was going to make you guess what it was. I was going to give you two hints. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Your first hint is St. Patrick. Okay. You I'm want supposed a to guess hint? from that. Uh, yeah. What what my what my my what my three form um, uh, thing is going to be? St. Patrick. So the second one. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, I. The second one is. Well, I'll just make it one big hint: St. Pat St. Patrick and the Shamrock. Uh, okay. Do you know? No. It's uh, so. Oh, so I'm gonna probably. I might even get in a little trouble for choosing this as one of my uh, three formed creatures because I'm choosing God. <laughs> I was supposed to get that from Saint Patrick. Yes. And Saint Patrick. what was the second hint? Shamrock. So so, so Saint, Patrick Saint Patrick and Patrick. Shamrock was supposed to lead yeah. me to God. Yes, yes, okay. it was. And here right. I'll tell you why. This so St. Patrick, there's yeah, a lot of great. Please. There's a God, There's a lot of great um, stories of the saints. We did talk <laughs> about at some point doing doing crazy saint stories. But St. Patrick, um, one of the legends of St. Patrick, of course, is that he drove the snakes out of Ireland. Right. Um, also, I think I'm, I think I'm contractually obliged to say that St. Patrick was a Roman. Uh, so, which makes him closer to an Italian than Irish, but I don't know. I, I, you know what? I want to abstain from getting into these kinds of arguments. But he was captured by pirates. Take a thing. He uh, expelled the snakes. So, you, from... so, so your, so your goal is to piss off. Yes, people. both everyone, everyone basically. Who, who, With this people, last one, I'm is make... to piss off Italians, Irish, and people yeah. who take umbrage with you calling God mythological. <laughs> yes, 
I want to leave here with Good. zero friends. I like it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> this this is the, bridge is burnt. I, I'm going to be canceled. That's uh, all right. I'm walking there with you, brother. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so <laughs> St. Patrick also, uh, you know, there's a, there, one of the stories of St. Patrick is that uh, when he was converting Ireland, he used the shamrock, the three-leafed um, little plant, to, to explain the concept of the Holy Trinity. So in Catholic theology, uh, God is considered three persons and one God, right? And the three persons are the Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it is considered a mystery of Catholicism, which means like no matter how much you think about it, you're never going to understand it, right? It's un- incomprehensible. Yes, right. It's, it's it's impossible to understand, but there there is a single God, but there are three distinct actual persons that are neither individuals nor like right. So, and they are the the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father is is, is the eternal Creator. The Son is the eternal Redeemer. The Holy Spirit is variously described often as the embodiment of the love between the Father and the Son. And it gets it gets difficult. One of the reasons it's a difficult to think about is I think uh, you know going back to art, um, I think you know Western art has depicted the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in in a certain kind of way, which I actually probably makes it less easy to think about. And you can imagine what it looks like. The Father is the old guy, um, and you see this. Yeah. You see this in churches like all the time. The Father is the old guy with the gray beard and he's on a chair, and there's light coming out, and then there's the Son, which is all the depictions of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Then is variously either a dove or um, li- like like a tongue of flame or light above the head, um, which kind of makes the whole concept even more confusing. Um, can I ask? Can the, I interrupt and ask two yeah, questions? Ask me questions. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm terrified of getting things question wrong, too, one, go ahead. Question one is a semantic question. Okay. Um, what's the difference between Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost? Nothing. Or is it just... Those okay. are just words, yeah. No, there's no, there's no, there's no difference there. Okay. Okay. Um, um, except that I would right, say... My second question... Yeah. yeah. Well, is it, it's, is it because Spirit is maybe more palatable to a more modern audience than ghost no i think it's that ghost doesn't um it's spirit as in like animas or like like soul or or driving force right uh and and yeah. ghost okay. ghost in our modern like usage kind of connotes um a shade or what's left over or what spooks around a graveyard which is not at all like gotcha. right but i think gotcha. like the older uses of yeah. ghost might yep. have been that so um Okay. So there's a shamrock. So, so my, my second question, oh, yes. my second, uh, sorry. So my second question, but, but you may be getting to this, so you can tell me to sure. just shut up. No, I love it. Um, is the idea of the three who are one, but who are three, but who are one, is that a Catholic slash Christian reconciliation of, of, of polytheism being bad and monotheism being good, i.e., Saints, I don't know what the difference is between a saint and a, and and like a minor deity or like I don't know why saints aren't don't make Catholicism polytheistic. You know what I'm trying to say? I do, and I don't think so actually. It's actually um it's actually an ongoing thing where like in Judaism there's it's staunchly monotheistic, right? And then when with the coming of the Messiah, Christ says like the Father and I are one, but he's clearly a guy walking around. So there's clearly like like two things going on there. And then there is this sort of like there's this sort of like when the apostle after Christ dies, like, like the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And that's also God. Right. But it's also not God as depicted as the father. And it's also not Jesus. So you're dealing with these like three kind of conceptual things that are all God. The one God. Right. But they're kind of manifesting in these three really different ways. And so it's 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 trying to come to grips with that, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Where the where the Jew, Jewish tradition is is staunchly monotheistic, and there's nothing else to really deal with, right? It's like you and God, 
And then all of a sudden there's this figure of Christ with the New Testament. And then it's like, okay, things are getting a little confusing now. Mm. We definitely still say there one, there's one God. And, and we are going to get to this because it leads to a lot of like, as, as confusing as it is, it leads to a lot of like, like infighting and good stories. <laughs> well, infighting itself leads to good stories. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, and my, my beef with it is like, it's a mystery, which means it's incomprehensible, which is fine. A lot of things like black holes and quantum entanglement and stuff are incomprehensible, but they are, you know, testable, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and it's fine. It's fine for there to be a mystery that's also that's incomprehensible and untestable. But I do, I do have a beef with, uh, so where, you know, where I come from, theology is called the queen of the sciences mm. and, and science is full of mystery. Mm-hmm. but it's full of testable mystery and this is full of like untestable mystery so i, I do have a beef with theology being called like a, like a like a proper science <laughs> um but the whole idea of of dealing with this you know this evolution from from simple monotheism to this like sort of multifaceted one god three persons i want to end on one story that this led to and that is the uh it was a legend uh, involving the Arian heresy, there was the first council of Nicaea, and the, this uh, one of the things that they were dealing with was this bishop Arius was arguing that that Christ Jesus is divine, but not in the same full sense. Like they're trying to make sense of this like idea of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. So he's divine, but he's not in the same. He's not like in the same full sense as God the Father, right? So there is God. And then there's this divine person of Jesus. This is not quite the same, right? And um, another wonderful character comes into this story. So Arius, the bishop, is saying this and making this case. And a a bishop of Nicaea called Nicholas Mm. gets so angry. And this is is Bishop Nicholas of Nicaea. This is St. Nicholas, Mm -hmm. who uh, we know of as Santa Claus. Uh, we know of it's Santa. He strides across the room and he uh, punches Arius <laughs> and knocks him down. And then everybody strips Nicholas of his robes and throws him in jail. And that's what happens to say Nicholas. He gets stripped of his bishop's robes, thrown in jail. And I think, because um, I love the end of the story, uh, they were stripped of his garments, changed him, threw him in jail. Nicholas, that, that would keep Nicholas away from the meeting. When the council ended, the final decision would be made about his future. During the night, Jesus and Mary, his mother, appeared, asking, Why are you in jail? <laughs> because of my love for you, Nicholas replied. Jesus then gave the book of the Gospels to Nicholas. Mary gave him an omphorium, like that's his bishoply vestments. Mm. So he would again be dressed as a bishop, and then he studied scriptures for us tonight and then in the morning he got back into the council and they shot down the Arian heresy and we got the um, the trinity as we now know it hmm. so that's my um that's my third that's my third triangle shape uh <laughs> creature nice i like it i ended on i ended up the highest highest height i could get to <laughs> i I'm, i already <laughs> can't wait to see what you draw for this Oh my gosh, I forgot that I had to draw this. Oh, shoot. <laughs> when I picked that, I wasn't even thinking of uh, that. Okay, well, now, you know. You're in it? Uh, maybe I'll just draw the Triforce. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I, don't, I won't cop out. I won't, I won't do something too easy. I won't. I'll, I'll do something good. Well, that was... That well, was... that was. This was an epic one. This was epic. This was... This was absolutely yeah. epic. And and so, all right. So now we need to do our, our traditional, we need to choose who our favorite. Our favorite. So let's see. So you had uh, one eye, two eye, and three eye. You had Cerberus mm-hmm. and you had <laughs> God. <laughs> God. Um, who do you love the most, Zach? <laughs> yeah. um, do you, what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? <sighs> that is tough. Um, I mean, I really like. Yeah, it's it's tough because there's definitely a right choice here. Uh huh. Yep. Um, <laughs> let's see. Well, um, which one do you think I'm gonna pick? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't know which one I think you're gonna pick. I just have one that I that I hope you pick. 
Okay. Well, I don't know if I'm going to... I'm muddying the waters now, too. Yeah, because I don't know if I'm about <laughs> to disappoint you or make you proud. <laughs> all right. So I love all of them, but I, my favorite, I think, is is simple, but it, I, I think it's Cerberus. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I loved the story of, of 1i, 2i, 3i. I think that was great. I would love to see an mm-hmm. adaptation of that. Um, the story of God is great. Mm-hmm. I don't know if anybody's done an adaptation of that. Um, or it was a time for it to finally be told. But no, I think that, but, but no, to be honest, I mean, I think that the God thing is cool and, and something that has in, interested yeah. me is sort of the more, um, for lack of a better term, pagan sort of like the, 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 when you see the things that are generally accepted in Christianity and, and other major religions that, that have their roots in, in other places and sort of explanations for, you know, like you said, like the Holy, where the Holy Trinity came from, things like that. Um, But I think, I think I'm going to go with, with, I think I'm going to go with Cerberus. Maybe it's just an aesthetic choice. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm deep into that stuff right now, so that's cool. Yeah. All right. So what now? What was your? Which was your favorite of of my three? Okay, you probably will know. Um, but I will just say it's. I love the three Billy Ghost Graph. Mm-hmm. That hits me right. Uh, right off the bridge. Right in that spot where it's the yeah, right off the bridge. <laughs> the tale you know, the tale you think you know, um, and then it deep into your childhood. Like it. Uh, I like triffids mm-hmm. because it's something I knew nothing whatsoever about or ever even suspected existed and i like um i don't know it seems like something i'm gonna look up might be a good background movie watch. might be a good background movie it is yeah definitely on could be YouTube. a good background movie and i do like the idea of these things shuffling around but of course i love what i'm gonna call the adventures of Aruman. <laughs> um, the best because man there's just it's so rich there's so much there yeah and that's um to of all those things, that's the one that is inviting me to, I don't know, explore deeper into. I, um, I agree. I mean, I already, I, I watched, uh, I'll admit in my research, what I did was I read several uh, articles and things like that, um, you know, blog posts, Wikipedia, but also I, I ended up watching several YouTube videos. There's some good YouTube videos on on this story. Okay. Um, I did go shopping for an actual copy of this uh, poem, because while it is long and dense, I think I would like to, I would like to experience it firsthand. And I want to know more about Persian mythology in general. Yeah, it whets your appetite. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, you guys got a dude. You, you're one of your villains is a dude with snakes growing out of his shoulders that eats brains. Have I mentioned that? <laughs> All right. Well, this wow. was definitely our epic, epic. Uh, yeah, this is going to be labeled a very special episode. We're at an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll see how this gets edited down. Well, for Zach Giolongo, I'm Ben Hatke. And for Ben Hatke, I remain Zach Giolongo. <laughs> That'll confuse enough people. Bye, everybody. Until next time. Hey everyone, David Universe here, producer and audio engineer for Ben and Zach's Monster Market. On behalf of the team, thanks for listening. Music for this episode was created by Twinstrumental. If you'd like to see sketches of the creatures discussed on this episode, as well as other mystical goodness, please visit us at monstermarketpod.com, as well as Instagram and Facebook at monstermarketpod. For creature recommendations, or just to say hello, please email us at monstermarketpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, beware, because they be monsters out there.